All right, we're going to go ahead and get started uh, tonight. Anybody got a prayer request? You say Theo? Be praying for Theo. Uh, pray for Kathy Horton, former uh, church member of mine, dear lady. Uh, she fell uh, down some stairs today and broke her ankle up pretty good. And uh, talked to her husband today, and he asked that we be praying for her. They watch online uh, quite a bit, but uh, be praying for, for Kathy Horton. Uh, continue to remember my mom. She's sick. Anybody else? Sheila and Scott. I've talked to him a few times. Uh, he's he's feeling better, but yeah, continue to pray for uh, Terry and Libby. We got so we got we got a lot of people sick all over the all over the county and state. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Be pray- yeah. Continue to remember for Chan's mom. Same. Be continue to pray for Gug. She's still recovering. Be praying for her sister Karen. Trish. Be praying for Trish. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Be praying for for all our homeless. Well, good. Let's pray for that man, too. Anybody else? Ricky? You say Kim? Be praying for Dave Owens. Anybody else? If not, then let's go to the Lord in word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your love and your grace. We uh, thank you for all the blessings of life, the way you provide. Um, Lord, you know the needs uh, that are represented here tonight. Lord, we ask that you would meet those. Um, Lord, the ones that are surrounding our community, our our families, um, our friends. Uh, Lord, so many people who are sick. And Lord, we ask that you would just uh, help them, heal them. Uh, Lord, watch over them, restore their health. Um, Lord, we ask that you would watch over those that we have that are traveling. Lord, give, give them protection. Lord, we ask that you would just continue to bless the church. I ask that you would be with us tonight as we study your word, that you would just give us new insight, and, and Lord, teach us new things. Lord, we love you. We thank you uh, for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, somebody said we're supposed to get some more snow tonight. Uh, so that'll be, that'll be good. Uh, open up your Bibles, John chapter 3. John chapter 3, we're going to pick 
We're going to pick back up our study. Uh, you remember last time we met, we stopped off in verse 6. And so just a little bit of review. Jesus is having, in context, a conversation uh, with a man who has apparently requested a meeting with him named Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews or, or literally a Pharisee, member of the Sanhedrin. Um, and he and Jesus, uh, what you find in John chapter 3 is the dialogue uh, between he and, and the Lord Jesus. And so we left off last time talking about the flesh and the spirit. And we talked about how they're polar opposites of one another. And we talked about the workings of, of the fruits of the spirit. And we talked about the fruits of the flesh and uh, how the Apostle Paul lays those out in Galatians uh, chapter 5. And, and they're different. They're, they're very different. And Jesus uh, is telling Nicodemus here, he says, basically, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. They're they're, they're opposites. And so tonight we'll pick up in uh, John chapter 3, verse 7. So let's, let's read this together. Uh, this is Jesus' response. He says, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be uh, born again. Now, this is where going a little deeper, doing a little study, um, kind of gives you a little bit of insight. So, so Jesus says here to Nicodemus, don't, don't marvel that I said this. Um, the word marvel there is the transliteration thumazo. And, and literally what it means is Jesus is telling him, don't be bewildered, don't, don't be confused, don't be shocked. Um, and so this gives us a little insight uh, to Nicodemus's demeanor. You know, when, um, I don't know about you, but I, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a, I know this is going to shock you, but I'm a talker. And when I talk uh, in, in conversation, I like to look at the person that, that I'm talking to because, um, you know, we communicate verbally, um, but we communicate almost as much, if not more oftentimes, non-verbally. Like, and if you think about it, the non-verbal communication sometimes speaks so much louder than what's being said, right? So kind of illustrate this, if, if say your wife fixes you a dish and you put it in your mouth and she asks, is it good? And you go, yes. But you make a face that looks like, like that. It would be a prime example of how your nonverbal communication has communicated more strongly than what you actually said. And in watching people's nonverbal communication, and this is this is something that I, I, I've always found fascinating is like as I read through different portions of Scripture, this being one of them, um, I, I kind of try to picture what, what Jesus' face looks like as he's talking to Nicodemus and what Nicodemus' reaction must be like um, in listening to the words that Jesus has spoken. And, and that's what I say when this word, the is used, it means to be bewildered, shocked. And so I think that like, when Jesus says this to Nicodemus, when he gives them that imperative, you remember in context, and we're rightly dividing, what you're looking at in that phrase that we went over last week, where Jesus told Nicodemus, you have to be saved or you're not going to enter the kingdom of God. You won't see it. You won't be a part of it. And we talked about that exclusivity of the gospel message. And when Jesus tells Nicodemus, you have to be born again, I almost think Nicodemus did one of these, or one of those, or you know what I mean? Like, and Jesus then responds to him. This is, this is the response that we're reading. Jesus responds to him by saying, don't be shocked. Don't be bewildered. Don't bewilder. Don't be shocked that I've said to you, you must be born again. The second thing is, is this message, all right? The message here is very simple. Don't be bewildered. Don't wonder. Don't marvel that I've said you must be born again. Then verse 8, um, he goes a little deeper so in verse 7 he just doubles down on the message and tells Nicodemus don't be shocked all right this is all piggybacking off of the previous verses of the chapter or the previous conversation verse 8 this is Jesus follow-up response he says to Nicodemus after he says don't be confused don't be bewildered he says the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes so is everyone who is born of the spirit so Jesus here is, is talking to Nicodemus, and in context, he's going to now go into illustration mode. And, and the reason that he does this is because of Nicodemus' bewilderment, confusion. He's going to try to explain uh, all the things that he's just said, and he's going to use the wind as, as an illustration. Okay, But 
again, some of this some of this stuff gets lost in translation because the word that we're looking at here for spirit uh, in the Greek is the transliteration pneuma, pneuma, and it's a it's a very precise word, and it means wind and spirit. It can mean wind and spirit, or or both things. The work of the spirit, Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, is pneuma. It's invisible and mysterious, like a blowing wind. And so if you think about it, what Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus, and again, this is piggybacking off of what he told him last week when we talked about it, the flesh and the spirit are different. And the Apostle Paul had the same message. They, they're, they're, they're opposites of one another. So um, the fruits of the flesh look like this, and the fruits of the spirit look like this. And Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, that which is born, again, is born of the Spirit. So just like we had last week, you've got a physical birth and a spiritual birth, right? And, then, and he explains that and then, because Nicodemus was like, well, how can I go to my mother the second time? Jesus like, no, no, you're missing the point. Uh, new birth, second birth, physical birth, spiritual birth. And he's saying that which is born of the Spirit is the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is the flesh. And so then he begins going into this, this thing, and he, he begins talking to Nicodemus about the wind. And you've probably heard this illustration before, and I've heard people use it before, and it's like, they think it's so clever, it's like, man, that's plagiarism. Jesus said it first in John chapter 3. And so he tells Nicodemus, he said, the Spirit, being born of the Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit, is kind of like the wind. It's like, you don't know where it's coming from, you don't really know where it's going, you can't really see wind, but you can feel its effects. It's, it's very evident. You can see, you can watch, you can feel it. And, and Jesus is trying to make this metaphorical uh, attachment to what Nicodemus has just said. He said, you know, you're not going to understand the Spirit because it's just kind of like the wind. You can't track the Spirit. You cannot make it come. Like, we can't conjure up wind. Wind is an act of God. You cannot make it go. If it's really windy outside, like Winnie Pooh in the blustery day, you can't, you can't just clap on and clap off the wind. Like, you, we don't have the ability to control wind. And Jesus says, all you can do is observe the effects of the wind. And this is such a brilliant illustration because this is, this is the Spirit. So, um, you know, we've been blessed to see people actually saved inside of our, our, our worship services here and, and during invitations and during worship. And when somebody gets saved, you, you don't see like the Shekinah glory of God, or at least I never have, and, and I've gotten the pleasure of leading several people to the Lord. I've never seen like the Shekinah glory come down and the voice from heaven going, they're saved, you know, and like, oh. And then, I mean, like you, then you would know, right? And and everybody would know before I even got on the mic. Hey, that's awesome! Somebody just got saved. Like I saw it, you know. Um, you don't see the spirit enter. The, like you don't you don't see any of that. But you can watch when if, if you've ever known a person that has a really powerful testimony, you can see the change that that's that's brought about in them. And so, you, why you didn't see the spirit enter them? Why you can't see the Spirit come upon them, why you don't see the sealing, and we'll talk about this in a minute, of the Holy Spirit, you can watch the effects of the Holy Spirit and the new birth in somebody's life as the changes uh, begin to happen. And so let's begin to break this down and talk a little bit about what does the Spirit actually do. So we're going we're gonna to start to build some doctrine here. So if you've been coming for a while, uh, you've heard me say this many times, and I'll say this again. Jesus is talking about the Spirit, okay? So the best way to approach the Bible is don't approach it with preconceived notions. Begin to look at everything fresh and new like it's the first time you've ever heard it. And so let's do that tonight. What is the Holy Spirit? What does it do? What is its acts? And again, our authority is the Scripture, so we're going to use the Scripture. Number one, we are to be filled with with the Spirit. You can see this in several biblical characters that they were, and the Bible uses that phrase, they were filled uh, with the Spirit of God to accomplish some act in the Old Testament or to do something, and then they're filled with the Spirit. Uh, next, the Spirit comforts, all right? And we're going to tie all this together with Scripture, but this is what Jesus referred to uh, the Holy Spirit as literally the Comforter. And in John chapter 14, when he's talking to his disciples about he's got to go away and they're not understanding and, and they don't know the way and how can they know the way? And we looked at that uh, one night and we'll look at it again. But he tells them, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. The Comforter, talking about the Spirit, will come. Well, it's one of its attributes is, is one of its names. It comforts the heart, mind, and soul of the believer. Uh, John chapter 15, verse 26, that was a verse that we looked at last week in talking about this, 
the flesh and talking about the Spirit. But Jesus actually said that the Spirit would testify of him. And so this is one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is it reveals somebody's lost condition. It testifies their need. Uh, it announces, it heralds their need for a Savior. And so that, that Holy Spirit, that, that Spirit of God, like, is the thing telling somebody, you're lost, you're lost, you're lost, you're lost, you're lost, you're lost. You're lo-. Like, like that's, what, that's what the Holy Spirit does. You need a Savior, you need a Savior, you need to be saved, you need to be saved. The Spirit testifies of Jesus. Uh, it testifies of the fruits of the Spirit. John chapter 16, 7 and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, and this is again where he's talking about it, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. This is the next thing that the Spirit does. It convicts. It convicts. The word here is eloquan. And, and basically what it means is not just to not just convict, but it actually refutes. In other words, when the Spirit of God comes into a situation, it will not only convict of sin, but this is what the Bible refers to it as a, a sharp two-edged sword. It, it divides. And so when you, when you think about something that is going to be refuted, it is disproved. Now, in the grand scheme of the biblical narrative, what you're looking at is, is two central characters, good and evil, God and Satan. And so while Satan is literally trying to get people to engage in sin and live a life of sin, um, God is literally saying, I'm going to send my spirit to refute that so that you know, A, the difference, and B, the one that is healthy and the one that is not. Um, There's one that's going to grow you. There's one that's going to mature you. There's one that's going to help you. There's one that's going to aid you. There's one that's going to comfort you. There's one that's going to bring peace. And then there's one that, if you follow these fruits of the flesh, it's going to bring death and destruction and, and agony and all these all these things. So this is what the Spirit does. It convicts. The Spirit will let somebody know, you shouldn't be doing X. <laughs> you should be doing Y. All right? The Spirit will convict the person and say, like, you're not doing what you should be doing. Like, the, the Spirit convicts on both ways. 1 John 3.24, it says, Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. Uh, I put this reference first, I think, on your outline, Ephesians 4.30 uh, testifies that we are sealed by the Spirit until the day of redemption. Is that God has put his seal on our lives with the Holy Spirit. And so when you do this, when you begin to look at these verses, what you're doing, what we're doing here, is we're building doctrine. And so what the Bible's testimony is, not only does the Spirit... Uh, convict, not only does the Spirit comfort, but the Spirit also uh, seals us. And, and I love the verbiage that's used here because it's, it's buried in antiquity, and, and basically what it was is that a king would wear an insignia ring, and they would melt hot wax on the seal of, of a message, and then he would stick that wax ring, that, 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 that insignia ring rather, in that hot wax, and it would form the seal, it would dry, and Useless knowledge, my wife says, but I think it's interesting nonetheless. This is where the phrase, anybody ever heard, don't shoot the messenger? That's where it comes from. If, if the message was received by its intended recipient, carried by the messenger, and was opened, then the person receiving the message had every right to kill the messenger that had brought it. But, but this is also going back, it was usually royalty and kings and, and leaders and, and that, that would put that seal into that wax. And if you think about Jesus, what the, 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 the picture that Jesus is drawing here as the king of kings and lord of lords is he's saying, Isaiah, reader, uh, believer, child of mine, what I've done essentially with my spirit is I've put my seal, I've put my seal on your life. Um, not only are you mine and I'm yours, but, but I've put my seal on your life. So I worry about the person that, that can continue in, in sin and, and not have any things for the fruits of the Spirit. I, I think that a person that is genuinely saved will desire uh, things of God. I think they will desire things from the Word of God. I think they will desire and have a natural desire to serve God. I think they will, they will have... Uh, comfort and joy in their life, all the byproducts that we read last week um, in building on that of those fruits of the Spirit. They will have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. These are the fruits of the Spirit. 
And then you'll remember the, the fruits of the flesh were contrary. They opposed those fruits of the Spirit. And, and we went through all those. And so this is what the Spirit will do is it not, only, it not only seals, it not only convicts, but then it unifies. Look at Ephesians 4, 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So now, if we are walking in the Spirit, because there's a lot of stuff on the Spirit, so we're just, we're just kind of building some groundwork here. But the Bible also tells us to walk in the Spirit and walk by the Spirit and be led by the Spirit, right? And so if, if I am filled with the Spirit and my wife is filled with the Spirit, then there should be unity in our marriage. Would you, would you agree with that? Because the Spirit, according to the Word of God, unifies. It should be the same way in the church, right? If we are all walking by the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, being obedient to the Spirit, and filled with the Spirit, there should be unity within the church. When we walk in the flesh, and we walk after the flesh, and we start getting things like jealousy and pride and anger, all those things, i.e. fruits of the flesh, then we're going to have issues. We're going to have problems. Um, if, if you've ever been in a church service that's spirit-filled, right, Holy Spirit-filled, you know what that feels like. It's not something, again, just like the wind. You can't replicate it. You can't conjure it. it, it, it you can feel the effects of it, right, but, but you can't make it happen. Um, if you've ever been in a service in one of those business meetings that dragged out for far too long and, and, and you, sh like, I show you a church that's seen a lot of people saved and people, like, on fire for doing what God has called them to do, I'll show you a spirit-filled church. Show me one where you find more copies of the bylaws than you do Bibles and you have two-hour business meetings, a lot of parking lot meetings, a lot of back channels, uh, phone calls, deals being made over the telephone, and I'll vote for this if you vote for that, and, and all that stuff, I'll show you a church that isn't unified and one that is not spirit-filled and one that is bound and, and determined to cause great destruction to the kingdom of God and probably wind up splitting. This is what, this is what it's doing. Uh, sidebar meetings, parking lot meetings, these are not the fruits of the Spirit. These are the fruits of the flesh. And so what we look at here is that what the Bible is saying is that the Spirit unifies. In other words, we are able to be unified. We unify around a common goal of, of worshiping in spirit and truth and carrying out the Great Commission and studying the Word of God and preaching and teaching the Word of God and trying to, to be obedient uh, to, to what God has called us to do as individuals. But when every individual is doing that and we're all pulling and pushing in the same direction, then, then that's when you get a strong, growing, vibrant church because it's unified. So then we come to this. The Spirit leads. The Spirit leads. And look at Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Galatians 5, 18. But if you be led, by, uh, led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. So, very simple concept. As I said earlier, we are to be led by the Spirit. What would, let's see if we can get some dialogue going. What would a person that's being led by the Spirit, what would you expect to see in their life? A person that's being led by the Spirit. Yeah, I would agree with that. But now let's ask the question, why? Why would a person that's being led by the Spirit witness, Bruce? Absolutely. And then when you put all this together, like not only would I be witnessing, but I recognize that God gave me that command. Amen? Like, I'm supposed to tell others about the gospel message. Uh, that's a great one. What else? What else would I see in a person that is being led by the Spirit? Servant. Yeah, serving. Servanthood. Absolutely. Why would, it, why would a person that's being led by the Spirit do that? <laughs> yeah, and it's what their, Grandma said it like this, it's what they're supposed to do. <laughs> Forgiveness. That's a good one. A change, yes. If any man is Christ, he's a new creature. Yep. Being generous, yeah, kind. Yeah, absolutely. Why would a person be kind? It's what you're supposed to do, right? Uh, be kindly affection one to another. I think that's Romans 14, 10. It, it's, it's this mindset of 
God said it, I'm going to do it. And, and it's this mindset, going back to what Marilyn said of, of serving, and it's, it's what Bruce said of, in carrying out the Great Commission and evangelism and telling others about Jesus. What, what else is a person that would be being led by the Spirit? What, what else could we see or, or what tangible things could we look at to see if that is indeed the case? Compassionate, that would be a big one. What's that? Give it to me again, Alice. Love, yeah, love would be a big one. Yeah. Anything? No right or wrong answers. I'm not looking for something specific. I'm just idea. Examining themselves, absolutely. Yeah. And again, we would do that because that's what, that's what we're commanded to do. Let a man examine himself. Yeah. Forgiveness, yeah, that would be another one, yep. Yeah. All these are things that are are spirit led. What what about this? And I know I'm being Captain Obvious here, but would humility or pride? Which one would be? Which one would be the fruits of the flesh? Pride. Which one would be a byproduct of the spirit? Being led by the spirit. Humility. Yeah. Um, all all these things. It's like this is what a person that is being led by the spirit. There, in in. In short, it's a person who's, I, I think I would describe it this way, it is a person whose faith is active. They are actively engaged in, in doing that. Like, I bumped into a, a guy today at the bank, and he's like, I haven't seen you at the gym in a while. Nope, and you can tell the byproduct, I've not been there, right? right? Um, I, and he's like, when are you coming back? And I'm like, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Um, I've heard the phrase that all important life changes usually come from a place in agony, and I've not gotten to that place of agony yet, but probably I keep at this pace. It won't be long. But, but this, this, is, this is a concept that we're familiar with, and, and something that you're active in, something that you're engaged in, and you're typically excited about, and you talk about, and you spend time doing. This is what I think of when I talk, when I think about, and, and when images in my mind are conjured of a person that's being led by the Spirit, it's not, only a, it's not only a person who is actively engaged in their faith and taking it seriously, but it's a person that when you, when you take a step back and you look at them, you can see the fruits of the Spirit manifest in their life in example after example after example after example. Um, it, it's a person who is all those things that we just talked about. Fourth, uh, or, or next rather, the Spirit speaks to the churches. Revelation 2.11. Uh, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Um, Jesus said it like this. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am like in the midst of them. And, and I, I think that, you know, when, when we were on shutdown mode, I don't know about you, but there was a difference, I thought, between being right there during worship and, and being here with my church family than there was when I watched it. Now, now again, if you think about this, I'm sitting in the same building. Um, I'm literally, I would say from that chair where I usually stand and sit uh, to my office, I'm going to guess, what, somebody give me a distance, 100 foot, 150 foot? I mean, if you think about like, how could, how could 150 feet change something on, on that level and I don't think it was the I don't think it was the location um, I think it was the people that I was surrounded by that were unified with me and worshiping in the same way and in the same mindset for the same purpose for the same reason and then you can feel the spirit do y'all do y'all think that that's I, I mean I really do I, I think that there's a difference um, I felt different uh, watching something, uh, you know, like I, I've had people call me before and say like, hey, uh, check out this service, watch this service. I'm like, I was there, it was awesome. And I watch it and I'm like, yeah, that's it, yeah, good. Yeah. And they'll be like, ah, yeah, I know, but it just ain't the same. You had to be there, right? Uh, and that's what, that's what I think the Spirit does. And, and so the Spirit speaks to the church. Um, and now I, I'm going to get, get into some very practical applications. Um, if you think about it, we talk about the Spirit leads, the Spirit convicts, 
Let's get it on a very practical level because, again, we can rightly divide the word. We can do transliterations. We can put it in context. We can build all this doctrine about what the Spirit does. But if it doesn't, if I don't apply the word to me personally, um, then it has the potential to become of an effect. And so how would this apply to me personally in, the, in our church um, here? And I think it would be this. Um, I, I didn't put this verse on your outline, but Philippians 4.19, which is an uh, epistle uh, or book or letter that Paul wrote to an actual church at Philippi. And he tells them this. He says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in Christ, in, in Christ Jesus. And, and I thought, okay, so if God leads, if God convicts, if God directs and, and does all this through the Spirit, and we need a volunteer for X and we don't get one, is it because the Spirit isn't leading, guiding, directing, and providing that need? Or is it because the Spirit is telling somebody that and convicting them of that, but they're kind of going, I don't want to, right? Um, th- this, is, this is the concept, and, and that's, that's applicable on, on my personal life. It's applicable on each one of us and for every person that makes up uh, of this this body, this this local New Testament church, like that's the way the Spirit does. God says, "I'm going to speak this. Uh, my Spirit will speak to the church." I'll give you another really practical application of this. I can't tell you how many Sundays this happens, and on the different level that it happens. Let's say I preach on my overall. Uh, uh, man, see, I always do this. I'm on to this week's sermon, and I can't remember what I've been. Oh, uh, I preached on servanthood. Was that last week? Week before last? Was that like, week? okay, so, so sometimes I do this game, and Brandy's like, that was like seven years ago. And I'm like, oh boy. Um, so, so a couple of weeks ago, I preached on servanthood. Um, and, and that's what, if somebody said like, hey, what was the overall theme of your, of your message? Then I would have said like, hey, serving, serving, serving the Lord, serving the Lord through his church, serving one another, you know, servanthood, servanthood. Um, that was the title of the sermon, how's your serve? That's it. It's all coming back to me now. There it is. But it never ceases to amaze me that when I, when I preach on something like that, how different people get different things from the sermon. And so somebody will come up to me and they'll be like, Pastor, I, I felt like you were preaching right to me today and I need to forgive that neighbor that did that horrible thing to my, to my yard and threw all that trash across the fence. I'm like, okay, yeah, let's pray about that. You know, and I'm thinking, forgiving the neighbor, like, I was preaching on servanthood, but they heard, forgive the neighbor, you know. Somebody else would be like, uh, Pastor, I heard you loud and clear this morning. It felt like you were uh, speaking right to me, you know, and I, I, I just hadn't been praying like I should. And I was like, well, I, again, I preached on servanthood, you know what I mean? And a third person will walk up and they're like, hey, I, I heard you loud and clear. I'm signing up to work the nursery because I need to be serving. It's like, okay, you, you heard the sermon, you know what I mean, like. You, you, you got it, you know what I mean? But then about that time, a fourth person walks up, and they're like, you know, I, I, I really, I heard you loud and clear this morning. I really need to be studying my Bible more. It's like, I literally didn't mention that. Uh, but it's not that all four people are wrong. It is just the power of the Word of God. Is, is I've also gotten this before. I was talking, uh, actually, I got, this was a phone call I got, and um, it was every now and then I get a call from somebody and they're wanting to complain about their church and I'm like I don't want to hear complaints about your church but um, you know go talk to your pastor but there you know but you know this guy was I know him and I know him well and he was like I just feel like he preaches talking about his pay I just feel like he preaches the same thing every week every week he preaches the same thing it's like okay well you know Tell me, about his, tell me about his sermon. Well, last week he preached out of Exodus 4. I'm like, okay. Uh, what did he preach on this week? Matthew chapter 6. It's like, hmm, that's very different content. Unless he's just getting up and reading a random verse and then saying whatever he wants to, which I'm not saying he's not, but, the, you know, again. Um, or could it be that you're being convicted about the very same thing every Sunday and therefore it just feels the same? He's like, well, you know what, that could be too. I said, All right, well, pray about it and see if God will show you the difference, you know. I mean, but it never ceases to amaze me how the Spirit of God works. Uh, but, but that, I forget who mentioned that one, um, but that one's probably, maybe you, Alice, uh, 
that's probably the one that is the most evident for me, and the one that's probably most applicable to this text is that when you are watching just a, uh, you, you know, you're at the lake and, and you're doing some fishing and you can kind of watch that breeze blow and you kind of feel it and it kind of cools you down a little bit or you can watch those ripples go across. You can't see the wind, but you're watching its effects. And this is what I think Jesus is trying to tell Nicodemus and he, and he just scratches the surface here. He doesn't get into all the things that we've just talked about and how that you know the Spirit will convict and the Spirit will comfort and the Spirit will lead and the Spirit will direct and the, and the Spirit will seal you until the day. He doesn't get into all that with Nicodemus yet. He just tells him like, Nicodemus, you're going to know it when you feel it and you're going to know it when you see the effects of it. And, and I think that as a pastor, that, that's probably the one that, that I would point to is that I've seen people saved, and then the Bible teaches that once a person's saved, again, they're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. Or you could say it this way, they are indwelt by the Spirit of God. And when that happens, it starts to bring about change in their life. And you can watch, you can watch that change, and you can say, man, this this person used to do this, 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 and this, and this, or they would never do this, this, and this, and now they're, they're doing these things, and, you, and, you, and you're able to see that change. This person that was so angry is now so loving. This person that was so selfish uh, is, is now so giving and serving. This person that was, that was so addicted now is, is free. You, you can see these changes right about in their life, and this is, this is one of, I think, our, our goals as a church is to, to promote a uh, an atmosphere in a, in, a, in a church setting where we give people the opportunity to be led by the Spirit and to answer to the Spirit. Last but certainly not least, excuse me, the Spirit should speak in and through us. Matthew 10, 20. For it is not you that speaks, but the Spirit of your Father which speaks in you. And so some people will refer to it as a gut feeling or some people will phrase it like, I just feel like I should and then you fill in the blank. I firmly, as a, as a person with a biblical worldview, I believe this is what the Bible is teaching here, is that the Spirit, the, God's Holy Spirit, will begin to, to speak in and through you. It will begin to speak to your very heart, and your mind, and your soul. And this is, this is one of the effects that it can have, is the renewing of our minds through Christ Jesus. And the Spirit will begin to do that. And, and every day, God, fill me with the Spirit, fill me with the Spirit, fill me with the Spirit. And God, allow your Spirit to lead me in, in, in all these things. And, and this is what it says, is that it, it should speak to me, but it should also speak through me. And, and I've always said that, like, I would rather see somebody's Jesus than hear about their Jesus. And I, this is the same with this. I would rather watch the fruits of the Spirit come out of somebody than to hear about how Spirit-filled they are. Because it's been my experience that the more somebody tells you that they're Spirit-filled, the less Spirit-filled they actually are. The Spirit-filled people aren't talking about how filled they are. They're just busy doing because they have an active faith. Um, that's all I got for you tonight. Anybody questions, comments? Give it to me again, Miss Elsa. Okay, good deal, good deal. I thought, mm-hmm. Very good. Anybody else? All right, let's 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 pray. Stay well. Stay safe. Um, apparently, it's 1 to 3 or 2 to 40. We don't know yet. Depends on which way the wind blows here tonight. We're just going to follow the science and hunker down and hopefully uh, pray our way through it. Let's, let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this day. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your love. And Lord, we thank you for your mercy. And Lord, we thank you for your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would fill us with it. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would help uh, us to be led by it. Uh, Lord, we uh, ask that you would just continue to bless the church. Uh, Lord, add to it as you see fit. Uh, Lord, give us eyes to see, uh, Lord, the needs around us. And, and Lord, uh, a willingness, uh, fill us with a willingness to do it. Uh, Lord, we love you. We thank you most of all for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.